and welcome to the second series of Around the World in 80 Teas. My name is Sharon Hall and I'm the Chief Executive of the UK Tea and Infusions Association. And today we'll be talking about Earl Grey with my co-host Will Battle and our guest Stephen Twining. Hi Stephen. Hello. So, apparently as a man who drinks at least nine mm -hmm. cups of tea a day, Stephen Twining is 10th generation of the famous tea family Twinings. He's always known that he wanted to become involved in the family business from the age of eight. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you can tell us a bit more mm -hmm. about that. But now, Stephen Twining is the Director of Corporate Relations in the International Marketing Team at Twinings and he is a master blender. Stephen represents Twinings at tea conventions around the world. So we're looking forward to talking tea with you today. Delighted to be here to talk to you. <laughs> nothing better. So today we are talking about Earl Grey. Yeah. And for many tea drinkers, Earl Grey is tea. Mm -hmm. um, and some are not aware that actually it's the result of a flavouring process. Yes. Uh, there seem to be numerous stories online about how Earl Grey came into being. So are you in a position to set the record straight and clarify the history of Earl Grey? Yeah, there is a little bit of legend to it because the, the, the story that um, we in the company and I and the, and the family believe is that while uh, he was Prime Minister, obviously he's famous for the Great Reform Bill of 1832, so around that period, a small diplomatic instance in China to which obviously he sent out a diplomat to resolve it. Uh, the, the story then diverges slightly. One version says that the British diplomat saved the local Mandarin's life who he was dealing with. And the other version says that the diplomat behaved in such an honourable and uh, British fashion uh, that the Chinese respected him. But either way, he gets rewarded with a gift of tea and most unusually, it's recipe, because obviously back then China still had a word monopoly on tea, and to give away its secrets was, was a big deal. Happily, this uh, diplomat was an educated man and knew of the Chinese tradition that it's the head man who takes the credit. Shane and all the legend of tea and all that, same thing. Um, and so on his return to London, presents it to the Prime Minister, who tries it and likes it. Now, in those days, we obviously had our shop in the London Strand. We were making individual tea. So if you'd come into the Strand in those days, if you had time machine, you could nip back there, you could meet Richard Twining and he would say, what sort of tea you like, blended different things together, when it was to your satisfaction, we'd written up those ingredients next to your name and our, our, our ledger of customers. So to do it for Prime Minister, a great honour, but for us, nothing out of the, the, the ordinary. I guess the difficult bit would have been sourcing the equivalent to what I believe is a mandarin orange. And we then sourced those and made them got the bergamots from southern Italy because they're very similar. So that is my belief as how Earl Grey came into being. But uh, great sadness, if I ever get out of time machine, I'm going to go fix this. <laughs> uh, going back to the uh, 1830s, there were no trademarks or copyrights. So neither the Grey family or the Twining family protected that blend because the Prime Minister served it to all his guests because he thought this was fabulous stuff, uh, his own special tea. And it would have been very, very unusual to have a flavoured tea back in those days. Um, and people sooner or later said, well, listen, it's, it's, it's lovely, but could we have some? So people, he, he gave permission for people to come down to the shop and ask for, in those days, it was called Earl Grey's Mixture, obviously Earl Grey's tea today. Wow. That's very public spirited of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, to, to, but it would have been his close acquaintance to start with because no one else would have known it. You'd have had to taste it to, to know it existed. Um, but yeah, and, and, and yeah, and now it's one of our most popular teas around the world. When are we talking? What sort of era is, was Earl Grey? Um, uh, early 1830s. Right, okay. So, yes, um, before trademarks and all those things were. Side of thought of. So we're on our way to the 200th anniversary of Earl Grey. We are, absolutely, yes. Um, th there, of course, are other companies that either claim that Earl Grey tea could never have existed because the diplomat, never, no one can find a record of the diplomat going to China. Uh, and, and there's obviously the debate about the bergamot and the Chinese orange. Um, but if you've tasted a, a mandarin orange from a particular part of China, it does taste very similar to the bergamot. Um, and of course, there, there is another company that has always said they made Earl Grey's tea, and that was Jackson's of Piccadilly. Simple solution, buy them. <laughs> <laughs>
Is that why you bought Jackson's and Piccadilly? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's an added benefit, but, but yeah, no. Um, the, the, obviously, a very they've always been a, a great tea company. We respected them, um, and there was always this great rivalry between uh, the, the two companies and who did have uh, the, the, the rights to claim that it was created for. The second Earl Grey and the fifth Earl Grey thought uh, that it was Jackson's and signed a document to say so. The sixth and seventh Earl Grey sign our packets or did sign our packets and do do sign our packets. So the, the younger generations believe it's us, and it's a very nice endorsement to have. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But wasn't the shop bombed in the war? So I'm guessing lots of records of. Sadly, yeah, it was hit by an enemy action. As I think we have to put it. Uh, okay describe it these days uh, uh, and yes a whole a whole lot of stuff disappeared uh, amazing to me that the, the the magnificent doorway of the front of our shop which dates back to uh, 1787 survived but the rest of it pretty much disappeared it's really beautiful that doorway it's definitely worth a visit to people going to Th london isn't yes, it yes it is thank you yes so are there any other recipes from that time that are sort of awaiting discovery um, or is, it, is, there, is there an R&D person who just the, needs to go the, back that, to a book? And, uh... the, the, that's the unknown question, isn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, sadly, the, a lot of those records, as I say, have disappeared. So a lot of the blend records of customers' individual teas will, went up in smoke uh, or, or got soaked by the, uh, the, the, the fire engines. Uh, either way, the, 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 the outcome's the same. So, yes, I guess it, it, there must have been more teas like that. Earl Grey's was so special because it had the, the, the um, obviously for us it's a delicate China tea because that's like we believe that it's absolute origins uh, and then flavoured with this very beautiful the oil from the citrus fruit the bergamot. There is a bergamot herb which you don't want to get involved with. Uh, uh, it doesn't have the same taste at all. But yeah, taking that essential oil out of the fruit, adding it onto it, just gives you that lovely aroma and it greets you and is, is to me one of the classic afternoon teas. If, you, if somebody says, what will you drink at four o'clock if you're having a scone or cake or whatever, it tends to work as a tea and food pairing across all sorts of afternoon tea type foods, which is just terrific. Why do you think China makes a good base for Earl Grey? Because it's so delicate, so it, carry, it carries the um, the flavouring of Earl Grey really well. To, um, you might get away with doing it on a salon tea, but some salon teas have got and they've got a lot of the citric character. Um, but it wouldn't be true to authentic, and we like to do authentic. Uh, and, and the big Indian teas would just be too well. They're too a firstly they're too lovely in their own right. Um, not the China cheese are not doing their own right, but a Darjeeling or an Assam, you, you just want to take in that lovely muscatel character, you want to take in the malt and the honey, and yeah, um, and, and they'd be too powerful to, to carry the bergamot. You'd have to put so much bergamot on, you then end up just tasting bergamot. So, yeah, the China has the nice balance between the tea and the, the bergamot. Fantastic. No, that's, that's, that's great. So, can you tell us a bit more about? Bergamot. I mean, how it, you said we switch from the mandarin mm. orange to the bergamot. Just, you, there is this would be pure speculation, and I, you were never going to get <clears throat> fresh mandarin oranges back to the UK at the speed those ships travelled. Um, so yeah, uh, a non-starter. So they must have looked around Europe for a, a, a close supply, and we had good good trading links with uh, Sicily and southern uh, Italy. So yes, it didn't take that long to get the mandarin red trade up to. To the UK, and it's I think it's the quality of that bergamot flavouring yeah. that differentiates a good Earl Grey from a, a less yeah. good one. I, I yes, it's certainly one of the key ingredients. Mm -hmm. The tea to me is the other big one, but the certain teas just carry and work together, and, and the, the tea we use seems to be in absolute harmony with with, with the oil and the, 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 the flavour of bergamot. Yeah, and I, I guess. Um, Earl Grey, around the world at least, people would really associate that with being British. Y yes. And is there, a, you know, one blend that's Earl Grey, or do you think that varies around the world? Um, there, there is not one uh, Earl Grey around the world because uh, in the UK we took that sort of Coke moment when, um, if you're blending to a historical recipe, 
you are stuck in time. A lot of people evolve, people's taste buds evolve. Therefore, we decided we need to evolve ours to, 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 to give our customers the satisfaction of having the best old grey on. Uh, I think. Uh, 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 but yeah, the original recipe still exists in quite a large swathes of the world. Um, um, and, and it seems to work with different waters. Of course, water is hugely influential, as we all know, on, on the, 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 what the tea leaves do and what they give us. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And how do you take yours? Uh, if I'm in a hurry, I will add milk. Um, I've never added uh, a slice of lemon, but people do. Um, and yes, just by itself is, on, on most occasions, is, is, is the way I enjoy it. Yeah. And as you say, super accompaniment to afternoon tea, yes. which are really are becoming so hugely popular again to take afternoon tea, to have afternoon tea delivered at home. Mm, yeah. So great amount of um, consumption occasions to drink Earl Grey tea. Oh, absolutely. And what I'd say to people is experiment with Earl Grey. Some people say it's too smelly. Okay, well, you, you could put a spoon of English breakfast in it to, or a bag of English breakfast in it to, to dampen it down. Um, my father used to refer to that as the, uh, uh, the marriage cancer's blend. The, 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 the chap might be more biased towards the English breakfast and the lady loved the Earl Grey. I put them together in the same teapot and both are happy. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and also the, the strength of it. It's obviously the amount of tea and the amount of water. So if you want more of that flavour, put in a, an extra bag of uh, Earl Grey, same amount of water, and you'll get a bigger hit of whatever. So, yeah. And do you think Earl Grey is a sort of a gateway tea, if you like, for people who want to explore different types of tea? You know, who've only perhaps always drunk English breakfast. Just, yes, I think it is, because it takes you to a whole new world and it would open you up into the, the green teas with jasmine and those, those lovely things. Uh, it could eventually lead you down to something like Lapsang Souchon, which is, to me, just fabulous, and particularly this time of year. Um, uh, so yes, I think it, it, it does. Uh, and there is, of course, the now the, 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 the modern uh, addition to the family called Lady Grey, which is technically that will be his daughter, because if it was Countess Grey, that would be his wife. Um, and that tea has just a little bit of it in the bergamot, but then some orange and lemon peel to give it a more citrus character in the mouth, mm. less on the nose. Mm -hmm. and some people find Earl Grey a little too perfumed, and that's fine. That's, that's why we produce a world of teas, because yeah, that's what tea's all about, finding the perfect one for you at your perfect moment. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I think that um, kind of about Earl Grey and it's sort of uh, it's gateway into into other ways of drinking tea is great because I've got friends who've really used it as a base for experimenting with all sorts of blends and Earl Grey and Lapsang as a blend as well. I often hear people saying so, they really enjoy it. Yes. There must be something about the combination of the smoke and the, um, yeah, and the perfume that yeah. just creates it's something nice. more than some of its parts perhaps. Yes, nice way of putting it. Yes, uh, uh, quite a few of my friends have have done that. And I hear people who put Darjeeling in it. I'm not sure about that because I, I, I love my Darjeeling, don't get me wrong, and, and I, because I love it so much I actually want to drink it for what it is. Uh, so that's a little bit of an adulteration for me, but yeah, the Lapsang one does seem to be yeah. the most popular mix with Earl Grey. And, and we've talked quite a lot in these podcasts about uh, the culinary tradition and you, you do see Earl Grey more and more in sort of sorbets and desserts and yeah. all sorts of uh, applications, don't yeah. you? I think you, I've heard it smoked, salmon smoked with Earl Grey tea. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, I think it was a famous chef who did that. Uh, yes, um, so terrific to see it being used as a, an ingredient because it's such a good flavour. Um, um, I've had it um, so that the uh, the raisins in our uh, fruitcake have been soaked in it. And all, yes. all sorts of yeah. I mean, I, I'm certainly not one to talk about the culinary arts because I have no skill in that direction at all. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate people who go and go, I can put this, this, this and I put some Earl Grey in it. It's just, just fantastic. And, and cocktails too. Um, you, you can, um, this is very cheesy, I apologise for this, but we, uh, we've got a recipe for a really great Earl Grey martini. Um, but, and it, yeah, it has that flavour throughout it. And yes, very efficacious. <laughs> so are you allowed to tell us the recipe for the Earl Grey? I them haven't too? got it hardwired into my head. It is on the website, though. It, 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 it is, is yes, on the yes, website, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I think it's really interesting, the whole cocktails piece, about reinventing some of these teas and making them relevant to the next generation of drinkers, Yes. particularly younger mm -hmm. consumers. And I think cocktails is, is a way to do that. Yeah, yeah, cocktails and mocktails, absolutely. A great way to introduce people to, oh, wow. And also to open their eyes. It's not just... 
how they might see their grandmother having a cup of tea. Uh, this is exciting stuff. What, what else can I do with this? Uh, and, and, and get them fired up. So yeah, I, I think Earl Grey is a good recruiter. <laughs> so it's a gateway tea and, and it's a good recruiter. recruiter. <laughs> and very satisfying. Yeah, it's just got, it's got everything. <laughs> Has it made it back to China? Do you find that your Chinese sort of yes. customers drinking the, the recipe that they sent out yes. 100 years ago? Absolutely. We started um, uh, send, uh, seriously selling teas in China in uh, 2006. Uh, and uh, English breakfast and Earl Grey are the two most popular blends that the Chinese buy from us. Uh, we're never going to uh, take our range of green teas out to China for obvious reasons, um, but they see, um, they, they call black tea English tea. So it's absolutely synonymous and they, they know that we are passionate about our tea. Uh, and yes, so they, uh, and they want to know what is good. Uh, and once they've done their research, then they can find it locally. So that's great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Stephen, to, for talking to us about Earl Grey today. It's really fascinating. And I hope everybody who's watching this is inspired to, to go out and buy some and try a cup. I think you'll find it a delicious experience. And uh, thanks also to my co-host, Will Battle. Um, and please tune in to future episodes of Around the World in 80 Teas.